1. I was out jogging the other day. COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted in my area. And I stumbled onto a paved path with grass and flowers growing on the sides, in a park that extends into woods. Kids commonly build these. There were tons of treehouses and escape houses in the woods. And it was leading into an open garden-like area. Think a gazebo with seats and a glass roof, but the ground is not cemented. It was grass and weeds and flowers. Of course, me being a dumb person went into the gazebo and it was filled with polarized stuck to the walls with turned off fairy lights and wooden clips. I obviously thought it was some teenage girl's hideout, it being clean and having a kind of TikTok vibe, the fluffy cushions on the seats, etc. When I walked out of the gazebo, the surroundings of the place didn't look the same. There was no paved path, no flowers and weeds on the sides. But the woods were still there, and the gazebo looked the same. I was super confused and thought, hmm. I probably didn't pay attention to my surroundings or misremembered something. I jogged back to my home, but I kept getting lost. I would be sure it was my house, but there was a small house where my apartment would be, so I pretty much started freaking out. I was walking around just trying to find my house. This never happened to me before. And remember, I was wearing joggers and a sports bra with a sweatshirt over. It's monsoon here, so I was feeling cold. When I was walking, I realized that everyone was wearing 90s clothes. You know, that retro hip look. So I thought, maybe there was some event happening. A costume competition, maybe, or some nostalgic event. I was wrong big time. I was trying to find my way back to the park so I could use the payphone there to call my mom and ask her to pick me up from there. I just ran. I don't know what got into me, but I had a feeling I wasn't supposed to be there. I ran all the way to the gazebo, but the payphone that was there all the damn time wasn't there. I just went in and sat inside the gazebo for some time because my head was hurting. And the last thing I remember was me dozing off and waking up. When I got out of the gazebo, the payphone was there. Everything was there. The paved path was there. I hightailed out of there and found my house this time. I really don't know if I'm crazy or if it was actually an hallucination. But it actually felt so damn real. And no, before you ask... I had a full meal that day and have been having food and water properly for the past three months, ever since I found out not having food makes me hallucinate. I've also been having all my vitamins and meds on time, so it's not that either. Could someone possibly tell me if this was an hallucination or if other people have gone through this? 2. I was a delivery guy using my own personal car. I did this for years during my studies. At about 9pm, I delivered a meal uptown in a rich neighborhood. I parked in the street in front of the house, turned off the car as I always did and rang the bell. The client had my car in his sight but was concentrated on the transaction. It took about three minutes and he paid with a card. This is when things got strange. I turned around and the car wasn't there. It was the weirdest moment of my life. It was a bright red Toyota Echo, Yaris in some countries. I looked in the parking spot, even though I know I haven't parked it there, and then the neighbor's parking, and then I asked the client to look in his garage, which makes no sense. Then I told him to call the police because my car just got robbed. At this moment, I thought I'd been set up. There's no way the guy hasn't seen my car get stolen in front of his eyes. He told me he didn't even notice my car at all, ever since I arrived, so he called the police. I was sitting on the curb where my car initially was, my head between my hands, because I couldn't believe this happened, and it made no sense. I didn't hear anything, and he hadn't seen anything. All of this in a neighborhood where they all got double garages and big houses. Then I watched to my left where the police car should arrive and notice a red car far away on the same street about 500 meters far. I start running there, 
and the more I'm getting close, the more I felt weird and started seeing stars and black spots. Maybe it was the emotion and the moment. I quickly realized it was actually my car when I got close. It was parked perfectly on the opposite side of the street, wrong side. It was still off, had the handbrake on, tested and functional, and was on first gear as it should be. I knocked the door of three houses in front of where the car ended to see if anybody had seen anything, and they hadn't. On the way back to the client, I noticed somebody watering his garden. He hadn't seen anything either. So there it is. I had to explain this to the client, the police and my boss, which the client complained to. I really looked as if I was high on something because I really couldn't come up with an explanation. They ended up telling me that I probably forgot the car on neutral, but the street was inclined on the other side, and the handbrake and gear was on, so it doesn't make sense. Then a theft, but it is impossible that the client hadn't seen somebody right in front of him take my car, and I would have heard something. I often think about this. Everything felt strange this night. People were acting weird, the air felt heavy, and I got a massive headache for the rest of the night. 3. My teenage daughter and I decided to take a drive around the town my parents live in. I lived there on and off for 30 years. She lived there with us for around 10. We walked and drove all over, so we are familiar with the roads. We were recording everything on my phone. We started at an old cemetery. Then it started to rain, so we decided to drive around a bit, then go to a local park. The first place we went was to a house the locals called the castle. A huge stone structure with gargoyles and an iron fence. It never stays occupied for more than a year or two, but nobody has ever gotten a story out of previous owners since they all seem to move far away. After that, we drove to the park. That's where the first strange thing happened. We turned onto the street the park is on, and both noticed the park was too close to the intersection. There should be two houses with really big yards. One of the houses had a big yard, but the other, the yard was way smaller than it should have been. The park is old. It hasn't had new construction in years. The part of the park right there is an old basketball court made of cement, cracked, faded, grass growing in it. The hoops vanished a long time ago. That was odd, but the park itself seemed normal. It stopped raining, so we wandered around the park for a few minutes and got back in the car. We ended up driving, sort of aimlessly, until we ended up turning onto a little street called Flint Road. It should have almost immediately curved sharply and intersected with another street. But it didn't curve. It just went on straight for way longer than the road actually should have been. When I went back later and checked on Google Street View, the turn is visible from the intersection. The street should have nothing but woods on the right side until it ends. But after about the right amount of time for the road to have ended normally, houses started to appear. They weren't particularly old, but they also weren't super new construction. After a couple minutes, I started getting really confused. I knew the road was supposed to turn, and I knew it wasn't this long. The road finally ended, and we turned. I haven't driven that way in a few years, so I couldn't be sure exactly what it was. But something about the intersection seemed wrong. The road turned dirt, and then things really went weird. It was the wrong road. I don't know how else to describe it. My kid was unfortunately pointing the phone toward the passenger side window, and there weren't any houses on that side. But the ones I saw on the right, there's no way those are the ones that show up on the map. And according to a check online, most of the houses on that dirt road were built around 2006. Even just looking at the video of mostly woods on the passenger side, looking at the street view of the area, there are some geographical features that are off. Things that can't be explained by just grading the area by the road or trees growing up. And it seemed like it was longer than it should have been. I figured out the length the dirt road is supposed to be. And it should have taken about a minute. Maybe a minute fifteen to drive at the speed I was going. It took us about two and a half minutes. For it to have taken that long, I'd have had to be driving at a walking pace. The dirt road ended at an intersection. 
with a road that puts us back where we started. Again, the intersection and houses around it seemed off somehow. But I can't say exactly how. I want to say it's just because I haven't been down in a while and things are growing up more now. But it seems like it's something about the layout of the houses. Their placement isn't right. But I can't point to something and go, that's wrong in that way. Anyway, it was weird. 4. This happened in late 2017. I was working in the online selling department of a fairly large pawn shop and second-hand store, where people could buy stuff on our online store, and I would deal with liaising and posting out their newly purchased goods. On this particular morning, someone had purchased a wristwatch. I don't even remember the brand, as it was just a mega-cheap one. I went out onto the retail floor and got the watch out of the cabinet. I promptly went into the back of the store where my office was located. It wasn't really an office, more just like a space off the main hall. It turned into a space for packaging, taking photos, and uploading new items to our online store. I placed the watch on top of a padded envelope, next to my PC monitor on the computer bench. Before I had the chance to print off the documents and package up the watch, Someone called my name out onto the retail floor as they were really busy and needed some help with customers. I went out to help and no more than ten minutes later I returned and, yep, you guessed it, the watch was gone. However, the padded envelope was still where I had left it. Of course, this was super strange, but I wasn't confused or anything at this point. I just thought someone had taken it as a joke for whatever reason. So I began asking all of my co-workers if they had seen the watch. Obviously, no one had seen it, and no one was even anywhere near my office whilst I was gone for that ten minutes. My office was fairly isolated compared to the rest of the place, so I was actually lucky to see anyone in the whole shift if I didn't leave the area. I began ripping through my whole workspace, lifting up boxes off the ground, looking in said boxes. Under my computer desk, on top of the shelves, through all the cupboards, you get the point. It was nowhere. It's as if it just vanished. I even had three co-workers at one point helping me come through my office space to no avail. I began searching other areas. Maybe I had taken it back onto the retail floor with me without thinking. I remember thinking to myself. I checked the cameras from the office. Sadly, the camera didn't go directly into my workspace, so it was hard to see anything. But I can say that on the camera, you see me walk into my office with the watch and then a few minutes later walked back onto retail with no watch in hand. So, that was crossed off the list. I also watched back the footage from the ten minutes I was gone, and no one had come anywhere near my workspace in that period. So that was crossed off too. Anyway, we couldn't find it, and luckily it was cheap, so we apologized to the buyer and refunded him or her their money. I then went on with my life. A few weeks later, I was looking for something on the floor that I had dropped. Maybe a pen or something, I can't remember. There was a padded bag laying flat on the floor. I lifted the padded bag, and there it was. My pen. <laughs> Just kidding. The watch. The wristwatch was back. I looked around suspiciously to see if someone was playing a joke. But there was no one around. I was shocked. I had no idea what the hell happened. I remember ripping that place apart a few weeks prior with three other co-workers, leaving no stone unturned. But it was miraculously back. It's like it reappeared out of thin air. I knew my workspace back to front, and I knew in those two weeks that watch is missing. It was not there. Anyway, that's it, really. Theories are welcome, as it's still a massive head-scratcher for me. I still think about it occasionally. Thanks for listening. Five. Last night, my friend George and I were outside George's apartment complex to pick up our DoorDash order. We ended up getting downstairs and outside early because the app warned us way in advance of his arrival. So we decided to just sit on the bench and have a cigarette until the driver got there. Meanwhile, two frat-looking guys walk into the building, talking and laughing while hustling some liquor inside. I briefly made eye contact with one of the guys when a cicada clicked and squawked in the dude's face while walking in, and we both laughed. About one minute after these guys walk in, a decent amount of time, 
our driver arrived with our order. We gathered our things and headed inside. As we walked in and up to the elevators, which are in plain sight in front of you, I saw on the left elevator that it was about to fully shut, but I saw two legs from the boy I made eye contact with standing there. George quickly pressed the elevator button as soon as it shut to catch the elevator ride with the two guys, but when it opened, there was no one there. Now hold up, I know you're probably thinking, well, the elevator probably just left and another one came, right? Well, here's where you're wrong and why me and my friend were so freaked out. As soon as we realized there was no one in the elevator, George and I looked at each other and at the same time just went, What? Immediately we were trying to explain this away. There must have been another cart. But we were on the ground floor, no other floor or garage level below. And if their elevator cart had already left, the other elevator to our right would have opened instead of the one the dude had just been standing in. We got into the elevator and didn't press any other buttons, and attempted to open the elevator door that was behind the car to see if the garage level opened. But after about ten rapid presses and waiting, that door never opened either. So there was absolutely no way this dude, or two of them, and we just didn't see the second one, could leave that elevator cart within a split second between the door being shut and us clicking the button to open it back up. Six. I was driving home from work last night. I was in a bit of a rush, so I was driving fast. I was hurling down the freeway at 85 miles per hour, windows half down, the stereo singing to me and yellow sunlight warming my surroundings. The road was irregularly desolate as there were no other vehicles near me. An odd theme for 5pm on Monday evening. Typically, there is a steady flow of traffic at rush hour. The car closest to me was about 100 yards or so ahead of me. There were no vehicles to either side or behind me. As I approached the appropriate exit to bring me home, I threw on my turn signal, scoped out my mirrors, and did a full head check to my rear left. The coast was clear, and I proceeded to hop into the left lane. Halfway through the execution, I realized that I was neck to neck with a box truck. I was flying down the freeway at nearly 90 miles per hour, and I was merging into a vehicle five times the size of mine. At this moment, time seemed to almost stand still. As I made eye contact with the other driver, I read the panic on his face. My eyes scanned the rest of the vehicle as I braced for impact. I was able to make out the logo on the side of the truck. It read, Don Pancho Tortillas. My knuckles glared white as I clamped my grip. My shoulders stiffened as I flexed my back. My brows scrunched and my eyes squinted as I clenched my face. At that point, I heard what I can only explain as the beginning sound of a collision. A sharp noise of clashing metal, yet only briefly. The sound ended almost as soon as it began. As I relaxed my grip, my squinted eyes, I regained focus. There was no box truck. There was no collision. I was in the left lane unscathed, happy to be alive, a bit vexed. I pulled over to evaluate the situation. I had no explanation. I was just happy to be alive. Happy to go home to my family. Later that evening, my wife and I decided to take the family on a walk. I was putting our six-month-old baby into the stroller, standing in the open doorway leading outside. As I was buckling the baby in, my Siberian husky, Luna, darted between my legs and outside. My neighbor Steve was standing in his front yard with a friend directly across the street. Luna, being the cuddly wolf she is, decided that she needed to go say hi to Steve. I quickly calculated the recipe for disaster that was about to unfold right in front of my eyes. Luna began to sprint down our driveway towards Steve and company. My house obstructed the view of the road from my vantage point, but the faces on Steve and his pal illustrated the danger that was coming. The familiar slowing of time that occurred earlier in the evening was back. As Luna came within a few feet of the road, the approaching truck began to join within my line of sight. The angle of pursuit was on course with an imminent collision. I glanced at Steve and his guest as they both frantically waved their arms and yelled for Luna to stop. At this point, Luna was halfway in the road, and the truck was about to make impact. Steve and his friend both grimaced and looked away as to not see the horror that was about to occur. I closed my eyes. I was certain that when I opened my eyes, my beautiful Luna would be deceased. 
thank God, somehow she survived. She made it across the street to Steve's yard. She was absolutely shook but uninjured. She was laying on her back while howling and crying in Steve's yard. She refused to get up for several minutes. She came to eventually, and we went home. For the rest of the evening, she was extremely affectionate and refused to leave my side. This morning, I was rethinking the situation over and over in my head. I decided to have a look at the footage for my ring camera. There was a car parked in my driveway that was blocking my view of the dog. But when the truck came into the field of vision, it clearly had Don Pancho Tortilla graphics on the doors. 7. This happened several years ago when my friend and I were in high school. We would always hang out at either his house or mine. We happened to be at his house that day. He lived in a pretty normal suburban neighborhood, with about a mile of woods behind his house separating his neighborhood and another one. We like to go back there and explore the woods every now and then, instead of staying inside and gaming. One of the times we were exploring for a while, we were kind of just circling the woods. After walking around for about an hour or so, just chatting and messing around, we came across a seemingly random house right in the middle of a big clearing. We'd been in these woods several times before, but never saw this house. We figure we must have just never come out this way before. We move closer to investigate, and the place is basically destroyed. It's a single-story house. There's a big hole on the back side of the house that looks like it was hit by a wrecking ball. We enter from there, and the inside is no different. All turn-up furniture, walls, and floors make up the inside. At the time, my friend and I were fascinated more than anything, making theories and jokes to each other about what the history of this strange house could have been. At one point, we thought it might have been owned by some kind of serial killer, because it has several newspapers scattered around with a lot of missing persons reports on them. Again, being dumb kids, we somehow found this more amusing than anything. As if this place had been put here as some sort of haunted house destination for Halloween. Anyway, after further exploration of this house, we found what looked like a hatch on the floor that may have led to some kind of cellar or bomb shelter. It had a lock on it that we couldn't bust open, because as brain-dead teenagers we wanted to go down there and explore some more. After a few more attempts to get this hatch open, we decided to head back to his house to get some bolt cutters. We get back to his house, grab the tool, and head back to where we came from. We had made our way back in the direction we thought the house to be in, but we never found our way back there. We thought maybe we had just gotten turned around but we followed a pretty distinct path back. We spent maybe another couple hours combing that small stretch of woods for the house to no avail. A little weirded out, we gave up, headed back, and didn't really give it too much more thought beyond a couple of internet searches for anything that may have been related to a house in the woods in that area. Nothing came up. Years later, my buddy and I are both married. Neither one of our wives believed our story, his wife even got on Google Earth and searched that area behind his old house. She found nothing. Anyone have any theories on what could have happened to the house? Before you ask, no, neither of us did any kind of drugs. We were pretty straight and narrow kids. 8. My dad usually finished work at 5pm, but this night it was really busy and he rang to say he probably wouldn't be home until after 9pm. At around 7pm, I was inside our living room watching a football match with our dog, R.I.P. Jesse, snuggled up on the couch. My sister was in the kitchen doing her homework. We were the only two people downstairs as my mom was taking a shower and my brother was in his bedroom. To make it easier to follow, I'll describe what each of us heard as we were all in different parts of the house. Shortly after, I hear a key enter the front door. Our door can only be opened with a key from the outside and the usual distinct sound of it opening. Jesse's ears perked up, and I remember being excited because this meant Dad was home, and we'd be able to watch the rest of the match together. Usually, when he arrived home from work, he would stick his head in, but I thought nothing of it because he was probably tired after his long day. About 30 seconds later, I hear this person start walking up the stairs. I thought no more of it, and went back to watching the game. 
The stairs is in between where my sister and I both were, and she heard the same thing as well as the front door sounds. My mom, who is still in the bathroom, hears the same footsteps, and when they reach the top of the stairs, she too assumes they're my dad's and shouts out, Is that you, Niall? You're home earlier than you said, but gets no response. My brother hears all the same things and notice how strange it was that my dad didn't reply to my mom, as he could hear who he thought was my dad in the landing, standing outside the bathroom. He remembers there was about 30 seconds of silence until he hears more footsteps. This time, it's the sound of steps walking up the attic stairs. He doesn't ever hear anyone walk back down from the attic. Here's the thing. Dad never came home, even though everyone heard him open the door and walk up both flights of stairs. Mom ends up ringing his workplace and he answers, confirming he's still at work. We're all freaked out by this stage. So much so, my brother and I end up going up to the attic together with a knife and baseball bat, because we thought there was an intruder. We never figured it out, and it was the only time something like that ever happened. 9. Here's what happened. Got back from grocery shopping, went in the back door of the apartment building, and there is a superintendent, Mr. B, with elevator number 1 on service, its door open. He's in front of it with a vacuum cleaner, winding up the power cord onto the vacuum. The cord is hugely long, and there is an extension on it which allows him to go far down the hallway, in a mess around the vacuum and in the hall area. He calls out, hello, to me, and I say, hey, Mr. B, back. He's got a distinctive Russian or something accent, speaks loudly in broken English, but is very friendly. He continues to untangle the extension and wind the cord on the upright vacuum. Big cord mess. Definite trip hazard. Can't leave it there. Mrs. Z has also come in and was standing in front of elevator number two. The superintendent says a big hello to her in his big booming happy voice. The second elevator's door opens and she and I get in. So I get in the elevator and she asks, What floor? It's a really hot day out there, isn't it? I say something about my crappy air conditioner and she replies back that it's almost impossible to bear the summers without an AC, and I should look into getting one. The lift ride has taken all of about 20 seconds, and we get to her floor, number 5. The door opens, and she steps out, and says to someone who is out of my view, Oh, I have a question for you. And get this, I hear Mr. B, the superintendent's Russian voice, say, Yes, Mrs. Z, and how can I help you today? As if he's seeing her for the first time. Not like he just said hello to her 20 seconds ago. The hell? How did he get to the fifth floor before us? When he was still wrangling the cords back on the ground floor and our elevator went up while he was still standing there. The door closes. I'm by myself in there now. And I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck did I just hear? How did he get up there that fast? I know him and his voice. He's the only one in the building with that accent. And I talk to him all the time. So I go up one more floor, which is, what, five seconds or more? And the elevator door opens. I get out and head down the hall to the right, only to hear the garbage chute room door open from behind me, back on the other side of the elevators. It makes a huge squeaking door sound and slams shut hard. So someone just came out of the garbage chute room, and the door closed behind them. We all know each other in this building, so I spin around to call out a hi in case I know them. And what the hell? It's bloody well Mr. B, the superintendent again. Walking out of the garbage chute room, now on the sixth floor. So there's three of him. One in the lobby area, untangling cords. One in the fifth floor, answering Mrs. Z's question. And one up on my floor, coming out of the garbage chute room. There is no physical way he could get from floor to floor so quickly. When we left the first floor, he was standing out of the elevator, in the back lobby, in a mess of cords. He'd have to throw everything aside in a panic, get in his elevator, somehow zoom up past us to the fifth floor, which is not possible, neither goes faster than the other, get out and walk to the left out of sight before we got there, so that Mrs. Z could approach him with a question. But then immediately push past her and get back in his elevator and zoom up one more floor, passing my elevator again, get out of his elevator and run down the hall about 20 feet, get in the garbage chute room, so that he's coming out of that room as I'm leaving the elevator, but do that in only five seconds. 
The fact that he's in three different places with not enough time to get around. I just went to my apartment, locked my door, and asked myself, what the fuck just happened? 10. This happened when I was a kid. I lived behind a music store, so we got to play in their parking lot when there was no business. We also used our parking lot as a shortcut to get to school. This is important. One day I was in the parking lot, pretending to fight a gang of enemies like in a video game. I had a wiffle baseball bat pretending it was a sword. I slashed down a group of invisible foes in front of me, spun and slashed another one that was coming to my back. I swung my sword in victory, much like Clyde from Final Fantasy VII. I looked to my right, and standing over at the sidewalk in front of the store, was standing... me. Or someone that looked like me. I stared at my double, and he stared back at me. Looked like he was as puzzled as me. I ran off towards the double and walked in front of the store. When I got to the front, he was gone. I ran back into the parking lot, and he wasn't there either. Confused in what I just saw, I told my father what just happened. He laughed and told me about doppelgangers. I love my dad so much. Two years later, I was walking home from school, down the street towards the music store, thinking on what happened at school. My thought process was interrupted by seeing my younger self playing in the parking lot with a wiffle bat, swirling the sword in victory like cloud. I stared in shock. My younger self stared in shock. I remembered what happened two years prior. I walked in front of the store to catch my younger self off guard. Then I remembered what happened last time and stepped out to where my younger self should have been running up. But I was not there. So I walked home, bewildered. I told my dad what just happened. His face drained of color and stood up and excused himself. Apparently he knew about alternate universes and glitches. But I guess he felt I was too young to know about it. I love my dad so much. 11. This took place about two years ago, and no one was drinking any alcohol or on any medication. So here we go. My mom has this really nice ring that is special to her. She has had it a long time, a gift from my dad. She always wears it, and the time she doesn't is always put up safe. Except for this day, when we all went out to eat at a restaurant, and my mother had noticed her ring seemed to listen to her finger, and commented on it, saying, I think I will take off my ring and put it in my pocket, so it doesn't slip off and I can lose it. Which I saw her put in her pocket. Then we eat dinner and have a nice time. And as we are about to leave, my mother goes to get her ring from her pocket, and it was gone. My mother was so upset, we were all looking for her ring everywhere in the restaurant. In the parking lot. Even asked if anyone found it at the restaurant. Finally, we went home. My mother just decided it must have fell out her pocket. And maybe someone took it or is just lost. It was such a beautiful ring. I felt so bad for my mother. Well, time moves on. And several months pass with no ring. Then one day, my mother yells for me. And there is her ring. Sitting on the kitchen counter. No one found it and put it there, it just appeared out of thin air. So very strange. But she was very happy to have the ring back, even if it was a glitch. 12. Hello. This happened to me about five months ago. It was Thanksgiving and we were having people over, my mom's friends and family. We were leaving to go on a walk somewhere, and were going to drive there, walk, and drive back. The place was about ten minutes away from where we lived, and I was driving my family, I just got my permit, and my mom's friend was driving her family. So my dad was to point out where I was supposed to drive, and tell the other family to follow me. He was making sure that they were right behind me at all times in order to not get separated. Now this is where the glitch happened. We had got to the bottom of the hill near my house, to take the first left onto, let's say, Street A, and the other family was in my rear view behind me on Street B. Now, I pull up to the turn and stopped at the stop sign on Street B to turn left onto Street A, and the other family's car is right on my bumper. Good, I was thinking. This is going to be easy. 
This was the first time I had to have someone follow me, and I didn't want to screw something up. As I looked left, then right, then left again, I didn't see a single car anywhere at all. I also checked my rear view right before the turn. Keep in mind, the place I live is pretty flat, so there's no way there could be a car anywhere near me without seeing it. I proceeded to make a left turn at a stop sign, and I saw the family right behind me doing the same thing. They turned with me, because there was no traffic at all. As I straightened the wheel after finishing the turn, I looked in my rear view to see something I didn't expect. In between me and the other family was three cars, and two behind them as well. This was impossible, seeing as they turned right behind me as I did. It's like three cars just appeared between me and the car less than ten feet behind me that was already moving. There is no way they could have pulled out from other directions or something, because there were only two other driveways with no other cars in them. The weirder part is that right when I noticed this, I also noticed cars everywhere that were not there before, and traffic seemed to resume as normal after this. You could see about half a mile down both roads. No one else seemed to notice what just happened, and I asked my dad if he saw what the hell just happened, and he asked what I was talking about. I told him about what I saw, and he said I just wasn't paying attention. The only thing I can think of is that while I was coming down the street, a bunch of cars got in between me and the car following me, but the car right behind me before I turned was a small silver SUV, the other family's car, and the cars behind me after the big turn was a red truck, a small blue car, and a black SUV. I asked my mom's friend if she saw the same thing I did, and she said no. She said that she waited for three cars to go after I did, but I saw her turn with me onto the street from Street B. She did notice a strange lack of cars as I did. Maybe someone can come up with something to explain this. I did, however, consider that I wasn't paying attention, but I know what I saw. I've been thinking of this for weeks now, and still can't figure out what happened that day. Thank you for listening. 13. I love architecture, and have in particular loved the Taj Mahal since I was a child. I remember tearing pictures out of National Geographic magazines and taping them to my wall. I've had it on my screensaver or background at multiple workplaces. I've bought calendars featuring it. While I have never had the money to travel to India to see it, it is safe to say that my relationship with the iconic building is a personal one. So you can imagine my surprise and horror upon watching a show on the Smithsonian Channel today, entitled Mystery Files, about a mythical identical Taj Mahal that was supposed to be built in black across the river from the original. All my life and all those pictures there was always a smaller identical black Taj Mahal in which the Queen's husband, Shah Jahan, lay entombed. I have never heard of this mythical one, or anything that was supposed to be built across the way. I was always impressed by the detail how perfectly it mimicked the huge white monument, but beautifully contrasted by its jet black marble, and about one third of the size of the original. I know about the mosque and guest house on the other side of the Taj Mahal, and the Agra Fort. These are not what I'm referring to. This was a smaller identical structure, situated to the left, our right viewing it. I remember as a child I even assumed that the big white tomb was for the king, and the littler one for the queen, India being a patriarchal country and all, when I found out it was the opposite. I was very impressed by the fact that Shah would actually make his tomb smaller than his wife's, especially in the 1600s. I always wondered if he ran out of time or supplies as his own death drew near, and he ended up having to hurry and settle for a smaller version. Or if his love and honor for his wife had really overshadowed his need to construct a physical display of his power to echo down through the ages. Turns out, according to the program I'm watching, that not only did this black Taj Mahal not exist, but was intended to be the exact same size as the white one. There goes my idea of romance trumping self-aggrandizing. I know this other Taj Mahal was there. I've been seeing it, thinking about it, and hypothesizing about the logistics of it my entire life. And it was to his left, not across the river. Now I know the Taj Mahal was built with sacred geometry in mind, and therefore perfect symmetry would have been of the utmost importance. 
I always assumed another structure was intended for the other side, but for whatever reason, failed to come to fruition. He had other wives, maybe for one of those or a child. I don't know. I didn't do my thesis on the Taj Mahal or anything. So, I don't know, and didn't back then know all the facts surrounding it. But I knew the basics that anyone with a fascination with the particular structure would know. The only thing that I know for sure is that it was once an intimate part of my personal history, and it has now suddenly become part of mythology. Perhaps even more disturbing, about ten minutes into the program, while I was still in shock and totally freaking out about all this, I felt the memory of the original trying to leave my mind. It was as if the universe were actively saying, Oh, don't worry about this. That was just some silly thing you thought happened. This is what really happened. Seriously, like my cherished, lifelong memory was just walking down the street away from me. What do you make of all this? I looked all over Google Maps, took a virtual tour, looked everywhere, and couldn't find a building matching that description, or a description, for that matter, anywhere. Am I mistaken? Does anyone else have this memory? I've had a couple of other experiences I'd like to share in the future, but I need to share this one now. In the middle of the TV program, before the memory is taken away from me. For good. 14. There is an old road near where I live, where an old mining town once sat. It's creepy and feels like you're being watched no matter where you're at. I decided to go to the road with a friend of mine after work, around 11pm or so. We took the road and drove on it for a while, taking side roads and exploring when we wanted. Him and I crested a hill, and my car started to cut out. My radio began turning to different stations, and my headlights began to dim and then return to full brightness. We both felt lightheaded and he passed out. I struggled to stay conscious but blacked out for a few seconds. When I regained consciousness, my car was nearly in a ditch, so I corrected it and straightened the car out. Our ears were ringing and we felt sick. I continued to drive, but when I looked behind us in my rearview mirror, our town was nowhere to be seen. All we saw was an empty, dark spot where our town was. As we drove down the road, the landscape was different. It looked like no one even settled there. The road became more difficult to navigate, and the fences that were lining the road were gone. We had no idea where we were. The road and surrounding area was foreign. My buddy decided to pull up his GPS to find where we were, and he had no signal. I tried as well, since we all have different cell carriers, and I had similar results. My car is equipped with OnStar and an infotainment center, and I tried to pull us up on it. Nothing. My own starlight was red, indicating that I had no signal to any cell tower. I still pushed the call button and was met with an error. We got confused, and we started to panic. There was nowhere for me to turn around to go back the way we came. We were stuck driving that creepy road. As time went on, my friends started to see campfires and teepees, while I saw shadow people and horses. The road became a trail, and became almost impassable. We couldn't go any faster than 10 miles per hour, sometimes 15 or 20. Our ears began to ring more, and the car became enveloped in fog and mist. When we came out of the fog, the road was then gravel. We had no idea what was going on or where we were still. No cell signal, no one star, no GPS. Nothing. My car started to stutter, the lights were dimming, and my radio was all static with voices every now and then. My onboard digital compass started reading north, then east, then southwest, then nothing. Suddenly, we saw bright lights behind us roaring up to my car, blinding us. Then, as quickly as they came, they went, vanishing at this point. My clock read 2 a.m. We tried to take a side road to try to get back to town, and I took the first immediate left. We continued down that road, then I took another left. As I did, we found that the road I just took was the same as the one previous. We then took a right turn, and again it was the same road. 
It has the same trees, the same astern, everything. This had to have happened a dozen times. As we were making yet another turn, what looked to be a truck appeared behind us. Headlights that stood tall from the road, slightly dim like it was an older vehicle. They edged closer and closer to us until all I saw was headlight. I felt like it was chasing us off the road. We were panicking, screaming. We wanted off that road so bad. The fog started to roll in behind us, coming halfway up my car before the lights behind us began to get further away, eventually disappearing. My radio started to get a signal, my phone buzzed with a notification, and my OnStar light went from red to green. The road we came to was the one we were on before the hill. I turned right, hit the main road. We didn't talk the whole way back. I dropped him off at his house, and I went back to mine. That night I had a weird dream about a shadow figure in the middle of the road. My car was parked and my headlights illuminated it. It was wearing a black trench coat made from a dark black material. It had a hood covering its head. It walked towards my car and stopped at my bumper. This thing took its hood off and revealed a skull with glowing red eyes. It pointed at me with a bony finger and I woke up. I remember this dream like it actually happened like it was burned into my memory. My friend had a dream just like mine, except the figure pointed at him. This happened a year ago, and we didn't talk about it again until recently. What the hell happened? Where in the absolute fucking hell did we go? Fifteen. I have a cat named Chip. He's seven months old and is very curious. Too curious. It's burning hot here, so we have to open the windows at night. I live in a gated community, and it's totally safe. Because the windows are open, Chip stays in my room at night while I sleep. I spend most of my time downstairs, and he does too. We have a routine we follow every day for going to bed and getting up. I take melatonin. I grab my water bottle and phone. I fill up my water and bring it upstairs. I go back downstairs and pick up Chip and bring him upstairs. I enter my room with him and close the door. He goes to the window, and I go to sleep. That's it. I did that. I know I brought him upstairs because my family saw me carrying him and said he's grown. I know I closed the door with him inside because my mom entered my room to say goodnight, and I watched as the door closed. Chip was in the room. It was 5 a.m. and I couldn't sleep. Chip wasn't on my bed, so I called for him. No answer. I tried again and said, Chip, come here. Louder. No answer. I worry a little before I remember sometimes he likes to sleep under my bed. And when he's in a deep sleep, he doesn't answer. So I stop worrying and go back to sleep. Here's the thing about Chip. He knows his name and understands the command, come here. He always meows back when I say his name, and when I say come here, he always answers. I wake up at 9am and look around my room. No chip. I call his name. Nothing. I jump out of bed and search my room, still calling for him. He's not in my closed closet, not behind my nightstand, not under my bed. He's not in my room. I look at my door. It's closed. Hasn't been opened. I go downstairs in a panic only to find Chip on the couch, resting his eyes. I call out and he answers with a meow. I walk over and set him on my lap. I'm confused, but calmer knowing he's safe. I text my mom, thinking she might have moved him when she woke up. She didn't. I ask her if she knows my door was shut. She's positive. That's when I take a closer look at Chip. His fur is clumpy and what looks like mud on it. I'm trying to brush it out right now. I know it's not his litter because it's too big. He's an indoor cat. He's only walked on the grass a couple times with a leash on. He's never even seen mud. Next, I notice that he weighs more and his belly is much more round than last night. He looks like he's just been fed breakfast, but I know that's not true because Mom never moved him and only Mom would feed him without letting me know first. Then I get scared again. 
There is dry blood around one eye, and splatter on his white neck fur. I haven't found a wound or anything, so I don't think it's his. We have another cat, and they fight, but once again, Chip was in my room, where the other cat was not. I also checked the other cat for wounds, and she's fine. I know many things, and I know that this isn't some prank my family pulled, or a simple mistake with the routine. My family doesn't pull pranks, and would never pull a prank involving me while I'm asleep. They know I struggle with insomnia. My family, once again, knows to not open my door and let Chip out. Only my mom would enter my room to take Chip out, because she knows how to not wake me. I'm still confused, but I'm happy knowing Chip is safe, and from the looks of it, fed. I'm keeping an eye on him to make sure the blood isn't his, and I'm probably going to give him a bath to get rid of the harder-to-get clumps of mud. This was not a fun way to start my morning. 16. Before the pandemic, I worked as a support and shadowed teacher for a kindergarten kid with autism. I was employed by her mother, not the school, so she bought me two polo shirts to wear as my uniform. One was white, and the other one was green because those were the school's colors. When my country was quarantined March 2020, the schools closed, and the kid's mom helped him with his online classes. They didn't need me anymore, so I washed those two shirts and put them in a plastic bag in my closet, hoping this would be over in two weeks or a month. But it wasn't. And since I don't wear polo shirts, I own and wear t-shirts, crop tops, and blouses, I forgot about them until I was looking for clothes to sell because I was unemployed. I opened the bag and grabbed the shirts with one hand. The white shirt was on the top, and I felt the bottom, the other one, was thicker. I unfolded it, and a new one came out. They were the same color, brand, and everything. My stomach sunk, and I felt like it was wrong for me to see that. I used and washed these two shirts for months before the pandemic happened. I knew there were only two. One of each color. I don't drink regularly or do drugs. I have never experienced a blackout or a bad trip. After a few days, I asked my mom and brother, separately, if they had bought me a new polo shirt and put it in the closet with the others. But because of the way we are as a family, only buying gifts on special occasions, and always asking each other's opinion when we're spending money, I knew that scenario was unlikely. Both of them said they didn't, and I explained to them, separately, what had happened. My brother didn't care much, but my mom told me to ask the kid's mom so I could feel better. I texted, asking her if she wanted her two shirts back since I'm not working for her anymore. I didn't explain anything. I didn't want her to think I was crazy. She said I could keep them, and she was sorry that she didn't have the receipt for me to exchange them for something else, because she was not going to hire me for the next school year, August 2020. She suggested that if I don't like them, or won't wear them, I could use them to clean my car, like her husband does. She said I could keep one in the trunk for a grease and the other one in the glove box for rainy days. At this point, I was somewhat scared of the shirts, so I kept them in my sight. Out of my room. My mom told my grandma about this as a joke, that we're all going crazy in quarantine. But she's very religious and superstitious and made me give them away. 17. April of 2017, my band was on a road trip to Roswell, New Mexico, of all places, to play a gig, and I believe it was somewhere in Missouri at night that we stopped at a rest stop. No idea exactly where we were, but I remember saying to my bandmates as we pulled into the lot, this place gives me a Twilight Zone vibe. It just had an eerie sort of presence to it. And I like that kind of shit, so it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. So I don't even know what the other two guys were up to. They may have just stayed in the car, but what I do know is that me and the bass player had to go inside and piss. This is just your normal setup of a parking lot out in front of a rest stop off of a highway. I don't smoke anymore, but I did back then. Me and the bassist decide to smoke a cigarette first before going inside to pee. He offers me one of his cigs and ensues to call up his girlfriend to update her on how the trip is going. So I'm just standing there smoking and chilling, and he's standing next to me smoking and on the phone. We are both out in front of the entrance to the rest stop. 
and we are both facing outwards towards the parking lot with our backs to the entrance of the building. Suddenly, while he's still on the phone, the bass starts casually walking back out towards the van in the parking lot. I see him walk away and his voice grows more distant. I don't recall exactly how far away we parked, but there's only one lot and I remember just seeing him walk into the distance in front of me, still on the phone with his girlfriend. This confused me, as I thought he had to go inside to piss. But I didn't give a shit, and I was finishing my cigarette as this moment unfolded. So I just shrugged and put out my cigarette and immediately turned around to head inside the rest stop building. As soon as I get inside, it's completely empty. But you have to walk straight ahead down this hallway to get to the bathroom. I remember there was some sort of Route 66 clock that had a spiral shape or something directly above as you enter this hallway. It just, overall, had a Twilight Zone sort of vibe to it. I don't know how else to explain this experience. So I'm walking down the hall and I get into the bathroom. And I hear someone in the stall who was talking on the phone. His voice sounds exactly like my bassist. No one else is in the bathroom. I can't see who's in there. But I'm standing at the urinal pissing and laughing about how weird it is that this guy sounds so similar to my bandmate but I know for a fact that it cannot be him, as it would be physically impossible for him to have gotten into the bathroom before me, when I literally just saw him head out towards the car in the parking lot, about 20 to 30 seconds earlier at most. I even said to myself, now that would be ridiculous if it was somehow him, but even as I said this to myself, I knew for a fact that it wasn't him. Except that it was. Sure enough, a moment later, the stall door opened and out comes the bassist, Still on the phone with his girlfriend. I'm finishing pissing, so he's behind me washing his hands. I turn around and see him still on the phone. And he's now walking out of the bathroom. I don't even think that he noticed me in there with him. But at this moment, I'm absolutely stunned. And I'm left there in the bathroom by myself wondering what the fuck just happened. I ended up telling him and everyone about this when I got back to the van. And he also explained that he went through a different series of strange events, but I can't remember the details of his side of the story anymore. All I know is that it was simply physically impossible that he could have been in the bathroom before me, when I literally saw him walk out into the distance towards the van, and I immediately headed inside to the bathroom. 18. To start with a bit of backstory, as it seems ridiculous to claim a driver would deliberately speed into someone without it. When I was still in school, far too many years ago, I was over 16 for the record, my secondary school went 11 to 18. I lived in a small town just outside a pretty major UK airport. Most of the people in the town worked at the airport, and there were two main routes out. One went past my school on the outskirts of the town, and one went all the way around the back and included a diversion onto the local motorway. Hence, most people took the route past my school, as it was more direct and, without it being school time rush hour, faster. Sadly, my school had a problem with hit and runs as many drivers, despite the crossings and traffic calming measures, were unable to accept that they would be slowed down by teenagers crossing the road to school. There was a particular issue with drivers making like to slow down, then speeding up when you stepped out to cross, then slamming on the brakes to stop inches away from people, or on a few occasions not slowing down at all. The actual incident. I was crossing the road into school one day. Normally, I took the bus which dropped you on the school grounds, but I was dropped off by my mum that morning as she had to go into my sister's primary school so could just drop me on the way and save me an extra half hour of sleep. She didn't drop me at my school, though. She left me at my primary school and I walked over. I was crossing the road and remember seeing the silver car. I'm pretty sure it was a Peugeot, but I'm not sure on the model. Approaching the crossing and started making to do the above-mentioned pretend stop, speed up, stop maneuver, but without the final stop part. That's where I have no memory, just stepping out from the curb with the approaching car, then nothing. There's no chance it didn't hit me, as it couldn't have slowed down in time, and I remember being well aware of this fact, but not being able to get out of the way. 
If you've ever been hit by a car or in a similar type of incident, that feeling just before it hits you is a moment you don't forget. The next thing I know, I was some way up the road, probably lost about ten seconds of memory, maybe a little more, and I was walking mid-conversation with another girl from school, who I know went there and saw around but had never spoken to. She was slightly younger than me, so we had never really crossed paths. This was an established conversation, and when I came to, I stopped and was pretty confused. But she thought I was being really weird and maintained we'd been chatting and walking for a while. School day went as normal, but when I got home I spoke to my mom about it, as I was still kind of freaked out. And she was just totally chill about it. She was the type to overreact, so this was strange in itself. She, I put this down to her being religious, not a paranormal experience, just said my dead great-grandma had probably saved me and not to stress over it. Still, to this day, I have no idea what happened and believe it was some sort of glitch. There's no way. Nothing pushed me out of the way of the vehicle, and the way I just jumped into a somewhat abnormal situation, like the universe just had to cobble something together to make it plausible. That I would never normally have been there makes me think maybe I shouldn't have been, and the universe had to correct it. I don't know. But it was definitely weird and still freaks me out eight years later to think about it. 19. I'll preface this by clarifying that I am by no means a spiritual person. And having said that, I have no way to describe what happened to us. Back in 2019, my girlfriend experienced a memory of a situation that had not happened yet. We were both in my bedroom in my house, and she was on the sofa trying to recall about a funny remark I had made to her. She says that she was reading something funny to me a few days prior, to which I replied with a funny remark. And she was telling me this because she couldn't quite make out what I had said. I was confused because I had no recollection of that convo. We dwelled on it for quite some time, while she tried to remind me that I was by the bathroom door while she was laying down on the bed, but I had nothing. She eventually shrugged it off and forgot about it. Fast forward to a couple of days later. I had just showered, and I was drying myself off by the bathroom door frame, which is inside my bedroom. She is laying on my bed, reading something funny on her cell phone, right in front of me. She starts reading it back to me with an excited look as she's reading it, her excitement seems to slowly fade away. I take my cue, and I start to make a funny remark about that story, but I stop halfway. I ask her, what's wrong? She's pale, wide-eyed, looking at the phone screen. When suddenly it clicked. She looks back to me, jumps out of the bed, and finishes the sentence I just started. She knew exactly what I was going to say. It was exactly the memory she had two days prior. We spent a few good hours after the incident freaking out, trying to wrap our heads around what had just happened. No possible explanation, no deja vu. She literally described that event days before it happened. I remember her mentioning specific sections of that story the day before. It wasn't a coincidence. A text that she read again by mistake. Nor could it be me unconsciously playing a prank on her. It was really a memory from the future. Update. She came over last night, and had her tell me the story again. She confirmed some things. The text she read was from a tattoo on a photo, on Instagram or Facebook most likely. She distinctly remembered bits of the text on the moment of the memory, as well as a certain movement I did, followed by something I said. However, at the moment she actually read the text back to me, she definitely had never seen the tattoo before. And then, as soon as she read it, she felt a weird sensation as if the memory was rebuilding itself. When she looked at me, she said it felt like her memory and her sight sort of converged onto a single moment. That's when I asked her if she was okay. Then she got out of bed. She repeated what I had just said before asking and completed with a punchline, but the remark had no impact at all. She said she had never felt so afraid before, before the feeling was too strange to describe. I'm obviously very skeptic myself, so I confronted her about it, asking if it was possible that she just saw the image twice, if it could have been a coincidence, or if she actually just had a very strong deja vu at the moment and the memory wasn't actually related. 
She denied all of it, said she was sure of the text when it first came to her mind, and she knew exactly what I was going to do and say. Her family has a history of dealing with supernatural stuff, and she has quite some memories about talking to angels with her aunts when she was young. She also got told once, totally out of the blue, by a friend's mother, that she had medianic powers. The friend's mother was a medium as well. Not sure if that's the proper wording. We might, after all, just be in a Jeremy Baramy. Portals. 20. This happened when I, male and 23, and my sister, female and 34, were 13 and 23 respectively. Saturday morning, I woke up about 10 a.m.-ish. My mom cooked me some breakfast, scotch pancakes, and we watched an episode of Lost together while my brother stayed upstairs playing on his PS3, probably FIFA. Around 11.30am, my sister called me and asked if I wanted to meet her at my local shopping centre to buy some clothes, and just generally have a walk around, and have something to eat. I wasn't doing anything and my friends weren't playing out, so I decided to meet her. She took a taxi there and I walked there, as it's pretty close to me, or was at the time. We had a generally good time, didn't end up buying any clothes, my sister did, we had a meal at a cafe about 1pm and got an ice cream each afterwards, where you buy a cone and go and make it yourself from the machine, although I broke the machine pin on the lever and got a bit upset because I thought I was going to be made to pay for this, but the manager came over and said it's happened a few times, no biggie. We went to Mr. Sims, old fashioned sweet shop and bought some sweets, weighed them up and paid for them. Going home, my sister ordered a taxi in, but this time I got in. The taxi dropped me off at home, and she stayed in and went home. She was living with her friend at the time. Generally good day. I played some FIFA with my brother when I got home, ended up having a bit of an argument with him, then made up, had some supper in the evening, and watched Saturday Night Takeaway and your generic Saturday TV. All in all, a pretty normal and uneventful day. Except... This day didn't happen. At least not to anyone but me and my sister. I mentioned me breaking the ice cream machine to my mum. She thought I was joking. I explained that at the cafe today, when we had food, I broke the pin on the lever. I'll never forget the way she looked at me. She looked... worried. But slightly questioning, waiting for me to say, I'm joking. She said I left the house once today, and it was to go to the chip shop to bring back egg fried rice and curry for me, my brother, and mum and it took about 15 minutes. At no point did I leave for hours, and when I did leave, it was about 2pm. I remember calling my sister, panicking at this point and needing to prove that I did actually go and meet her. She answered, slightly sleepy by this point, as it was about 11pm before this conversation occurred, and asked her what we did today on loudspeaker. She went through the exact same story I've just told my mum, including the ice cream machine, including what she bought, and including what sweets I got from Mr. Sims. At this point, I ran up to my room and brought the remaining sweets down to prove that I bought these today, and went to the shopping center. My mom at this point had tears in her eyes, hoping, I guess, that this was some prank me and my sister had conjured up. Me and my sister agreed to talk about it tomorrow, but texted me afterwards asking if Mum's all right. I said, yeah, and if she's not... Neither is my brother, because he's promising me that at the time I was out, he was playing FIFA with me in his room. Tomorrow comes, and my sister calls me in a panic, claiming that her boss sent her home from work because she got called in yesterday instead. She said that her boss had called her yesterday morning and asked her to cover someone's shift, and she can have Sunday off. Essentially just swapping a shift, which she agreed to. She said she didn't push him too much because she didn't want him to think she was mental and lose her job. To this day, our mum, brother, and even my sister's now ex-roommate are wholeheartedly convinced that the day me and my sister spent together didn't happen. She no longer has contact with her old boss, but he paid her for the Saturday despite not working Sunday. And me and my sister can recall tiny details to each other about the day we had over the years, this has generally drifted into the background, but sometimes gets brought up now and again, and has become something that's almost taboo to talk about in our family, 
because of the issues it caused around the time. It hasn't happened since. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Glitch Monthly, number 17. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. Please do click the like button and share the video around if you could. The more people who get to see them, the better. Even if you just have a particular story you especially enjoyed, send them that timestamp so they'll be able to watch it. I'd also like to give a little shout out to the author of story number 10. Uh, let's see, their YouTube name is uh, Reluge. I think I'm pronouncing it Reluge. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, they also have a YouTube channel, and I will link to their channel next to story number 10 in the description. Thank you very much. Right, what day is this? Let's see. It is the 24th today. I don't have any special plans for today. That's good. Uh, I have to make one video just for tomorrow's paranormal, but that's okay. Right, I'm off to do lots and lots of editing, and as I do so, I'll be listening to a new podcast I discovered called Verity, uh, where a group of six ladies talk about Doctor Who. Alrighty, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.